Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, we are this year marking the 50th anniversary of the Sexual Offences Act of 1967, which many people will attribute to be a liberalisation, a forward step for gay and bisexual men, and perhaps a statute that opened the door to the subsequent wave of LGBT activism. There is, of course, a lot of misunderstanding about the 1967 Act. Um, many people are under the false impression that this legislation fully decriminalised or even legalised male homosexuality. How wrong they are. The 1967 reform was a very partial, limited decriminalisation, certainly not a legalisation. It only applied to England and Wales, not being extended to Scotland until 1980, and not to Northern Ireland until 1982. And only was extended to Northern Ireland as a result of a very brave gay man, Jeff Dudgeon, who took a case to the European Court of Human Rights, arguing that the ban on male homosexuality in Northern Ireland was an infringement of his human rights. It was unjust, unlawful discrimination. And that pitch was accepted by the European Court, which ruled in his favour and thereby forced the British government to decriminalise male homosexuality in Northern Ireland. So that reform was not even initiated by a UK government. It had to come from Europe. The 1967 Act also did not apply to the armed forces or to the merchant navy, where sex between men remained a serious criminal offence. Gay military personnel were still being jailed right up to 1993 for behaviour that was no longer a crime between gay civilians. The age of consent in 1967 was set at 21 for sex between men compared to 16 between men and women. Aiding, abetting, or facilitating a homosexual act, even certain lawful homosexual acts that had been decriminalised in 1967, remained a crime as did public displays of affection and men chatting up men in a public place. Now, I'm sure you've all seen or heard of experiences where boy meets girl on the street or in the supermarket, they get talking, they take a shine to each other, they exchange names and phone numbers. Until 2003, if two men did that, it was a criminal offence punishable by up to two years jail. Furthermore, after 1967, gay sex was only lawful if it took place in private, which meant in a person's own home, behind locked doors and windows, with the curtains drawn, and with no other person present in any part of the house. It continued to be a crime if more than two men had sex together, if they filmed or photographed themselves having sex, they could be jailed. And in 1997, seven gay and bisexual men in Bolton in the northwest of England were arrested, prosecuted, and convicted for consenting adult same-sex relations in the privacy of their own home because more than two people were present at the time. 1997, 30 years after the 1967 Act was legislated. 
So the truth is that the 1967 Act did not repeal the centuries-old anti-gay laws. They all remained on the statute book under the heading, and I quote, unnatural offences. Even the language of the law was prejudiced. The main offences criminalising same-sex behaviour continued to be buggery, in other words, anal sex, gross indecency, a consensual offence involving any sexual act other than anal sex, including mere touching and kissing. Procuring, which was aiding and abetting or facilitating a homosexual act, even in certain circumstances of otherwise lawful or non-prosecutable homosexual act, and soliciting and importuning, which basically meant loitering, meeting or chatting up men in a public place. Gay and bisexual men and a small number of lesbians were also prosecuted under public order, breach of the peace, and various other obscure ancient legislation, such as the Town Police Clauses Act of 1847, the Ecclesiastical Courts Jurisdiction Act of 1860, formerly part of the Brawling Act of 1551, and so on and so on. I recall in the 1980s and even in the early 1990s, gay and lesbian couples being arrested for merely expressing affection. I think a particular example was Two lesbians were arrested at Victoria Station. They'd gone there because one lived, I think, in Brighton, and her girlfriend was <coughs> saying goodbye to her, and they had a good cuddle and a kiss, like any straight couple would. They were arrested under the Public Order Act 1986 for behaviour likely to cause harassment, alarm, or distress and they were fined £60 and got a criminal conviction. When similar behaviour by a heterosexual couple would have never ever resulted in any police action at all. Post-1967, the anti-gay laws were not enforced only in certain narrow circumstances that I previously described. But most aspects of gay male life remained criminal. In fact, the repression got much, much worse. In 1966, 420 men were convicted of gross indecency. By 1974, just those few years later, the number of convictions for that offence increased by over 400% to 1,711. It seems the authorities were determined to ensure that the partial liberalisation of 1967 did not lead to the social acceptance of what they still regarded as a perversion and vice. Now, of course, conviction and a criminal record was not the only consequence. Many of these men faced severe fines, substantial fines, running to a thousand pounds plus. And this was happening right up until the early to mid 1990s, just on the outskirts of London. At Stew Ponds in Surrey, Gay men who tramped all the way through the forest to have sex discreetly were caught in a police sting and they were fined £1,000. No evidence that any member of the public witnessed or was offended by their actions. They were only caught 
because of a deliberate police operation to hunt and find them out. Many others, of course, suffered with jail terms. But that was just a start. In those bad old days, I'd say right up into the early 1990s, the consequences of getting a conviction for a gay offence was often that you'd be sacked from your job because the police would often conspire with employers to make sure that the person convicted was further penalised. The suggestion would be that this is not a fit and proper person to have in your employment. So many gay and bisexual men who were convicted ended up losing their jobs. If they were married, it often led to the breakup of their marriages. Um, in some cases, they suffered abuse or ostracism by family members and neighbours. Some were subjected to mob violence and queer bashing attacks because in the bad old days, local newspapers would always publish men's names and their full addresses, giving a green light for homophobes and far-right extremist groups to attack their homes and attack them as individuals. So it's no wonder that many of these men suffered great depression and anxiety. Consequently, some became alcoholics, others had mental breakdowns, some attempted or actually committed suicide. So the results of these anti-gay laws were extreme, very extreme indeed. It wasn't just arrest, prosecution, conviction, and punishment. It was all the other consequential knock-on effects. In addition, of course, until very recently, homophobic discrimination in housing, employment, and the provision of goods and services remained lawful by default. There was no legal protection against it. If you suffer discrimination on account of your gender identity or your sexual orientation, you had no legal comeback. People who hated you because you were LGBT or I could get away with it. Thousands, I stress thousands, were denied employment or sacked from their jobs as a result. Many others were refused or evicted from rented accommodation or denied service in pubs and shops. And when that happened, they just had to bite their lips and suffer the consequences because there was no legal protection. In 1971, when I was involved in the Gay Liberation Front in London, we heard about a series of pubs and cafes that were refusing to serve what they called puffs and dykes. So inspired by the Black Civil Rights Movement, we began a series of freedom rides and sit-ins in these places to try and break the ban. So in October, 1971, we began a sitting in a number of pubs in West London. We demanded to be served. The landlords called the police. We were arrested. I can remember being taken out of that pub on a freezing October night, being made by the police to strip down to my underwear with about six other men. And then a burly sergeant came along and put his hands in my underpants and squeezed my testicles until I screamed. There was nothing I could do. Because in those days, the police truly were above the law, and even more so if you were gay. But the long-term consequence was that we kept on going back to that pub and other pubs, including the Joe Lyon Cafe, which existed near Piccadilly Circus, which also refused to serve particularly trans people. And we demanded to be served. And eventually, 
we made such a nuisance of ourselves that we were beginning to drive away the straight customers and finally the landlords, the managers realized that this was too big a price for them to pay and that for the sake of the money, they would eventually serve us. So we won. We won just like the Black Civil Rights Movement won when it overturned the bans on African Americans being served in shops and lunch counters in the Deep South in the 1960s. In the 1980s, the Conservative government embarked on its family values campaign and then later its Victorian values campaign. One of the targets was the LGBTI community. We were deemed to not fulfill family values, to be out of step with Margaret Thatcher's vision of a return to the moral purity of the Victorian era. And we had conservative members of parliament and government ministers denouncing us in language that many of you may have heard from the BNP or other far-right extremist groups. In parliament, they would abuse us using the foulest language. And that was regarded as normal. Completely acceptable. No Conservative MP was upgraded. No cabinet minister was condemned. This was sanctioned at the highest level by Margaret Thatcher herself. In the sense that she never spoke out against it. And that she endorsed the anti-gay policies of her government. What made things worse, of course, was the advent of AIDS, which was largely and often depicted as, quote, the gay play. We had tabloid headlines, warning, the gay plague will kill us all. Danger, one million will die. Again, we had a repeat of an earlier era. Gay and bisexual men or straight men who weren't macho enough, who were assumed to perhaps be gay, were refused service in pubs, cafes, and restaurants. I recall the case of two lesbians who went to a restaurant to eat and were told they should go away and bring their own cutlery, their own knives and forks. I had two gay friends who'd been going to a local pub for 15 years, and they were turned away and told, bring your own glasses. That's what, in extreme form, the reaction was like. And this did lead to a huge upsurge in anti-LGBTI prejudice. Perhaps the crowning glory of this bigotry was in 1987 at the Conservative Party conference when the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher used her keynote speech to attack the notion that people had a right to be gay. The Prime Minister of this country attacking the whole LGBT community and our right to exist. We were labelled the enemy within. So the consequence was a massive rise in queer bashing murders and convictions for consenting same-sex acts. During the period 1986 to 1991, I identified over 50 murders of men in circumstances that pointed to a homophobic motive. And these were just the murders that I was able to find or that people alerted me to. I'm sure it was just the tip of the iceberg. And when I say the evidence of uh, homophobic motive, sometimes there were witnesses who overheard homophobic abuse. 
Other times it was just the extreme frenzied nature of the murder that pointed to a hit motive. Normally in a murder, someone gets stabbed once or twice, or get bashed over the head once or twice. But in these instances, we were finding men who were being stabbed 30, 40, 50, 70 times, who had their genitals cut off, who had their heads partly decapitated. Extreme, prolonged, frenzy violence, which psychologists and other advisors said was indicative of the strong likelihood of a hate crime and a homophobic motive. Despite this wave of anti-LGBTI violence, police action to find the killers was often derisive. There were often very few or very perfunctory public appeals for help. There was no liaison with the LGBT community. It's almost as if the police took the view <coughs> that we were criminals and didn't deserve the protection of the law. That we were so distasteful, so morally abhorrent, that our debts didn't require a proper investigation. It wasn't just gay and bisexual men who were victims. There were some straight men who were thought to be gay because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time or weren't sufficiently macho. They were also queer bashed. I remember the case in the early 1990s of a young man in his late teens. He went to see his girlfriend off on the tube at Cuffham Common Tube Station. After he said goodbye, he walked back across Clapham Common. And on the assumption that he was gay, a gang of youths set upon him and beat him to death. They didn't just beat him to death. When he was on the ground, they kicked him so hard in the head that he was decapitated. And the police said his head was swollen to twice the size of a normal human head. He was totally straight. Homophobia kills, and sometimes even kills straight. So as I said, you know, we were still seen as criminals and degenerates by many police officers. We didn't deserve protection of the law. I can remember going on gay pride parades in the 70s. And the police would have almost one police officer for every one or two people in the march. We were hemmed in as though we were like terrorists or terrorist supporters. And the police would openly abuse us. You fucking queers. I hate doing this march with all these fucking queers and pups and dykes. Those kinds of oh, words came out of the mouths of uniformed police officers on duty. And they got away with it. Because in those days, they could. In 1989, after this huge campaign by the Conservatives against the LGBTI community, including the passage of Section 28 in 1988, which prohibited local authorities from so-called promotion of homosexuality by local councils, education authorities, and health authorities. In the wake of all this, the number of men convicted or cautioned for the offense of gross indecency, any sexual contact other than anal sex, hit 1,718. In that one year, 1989, 22 years after the 1967 Sexual Offences Act. That was almost as many convictions for this offence as in the year 1950 to 55, when male homosexuality was totally illegal, 
and when Britain was gripped by a McCarthyite style anti gay ritual. Almost as many in 1989 as in 1950-55. Of course, as I said, this big rise in indecency prosecutions in the late 80s coincided with the AIDS panic and the scapegoating of gay and bisexual men and the conservative government's um, manipulation of public opinion to uh, attack the LGBT community. The Gross Indecency Law, which was initially passed in 1885 in a moral panic by the Victorians, as you know, it had been used to convict Alan Turing, the mathematical computer genius, in 1952, and before him to convict and jail the playwright Oscar Wilde in 1895. A prison term of two years hard labor and it really was hard labor, which effectively killed one of the greatest playwrights of the modern era. He died just three years after his release from prison. Now that law, that gross indecency law, was only repealed in 2003. Likewise, the criminalization of buggery, anal sex, Enacted in 1533, during the reign of King Henry VIII, was only finally repealed in 2003. It is only since that year, just 14 years ago, that for the first time in over 500 years, we've had a criminal code that does not discriminate on the grounds of sexual orientation. So progress at last, but homophobia isn't over yet. In 2013, to create a police and home office database of serious sex offenders, the police turned up unannounced on people's doorsteps to demand DNA samples from men who, like Alan Turing, had been convicted of consenting adult same-sex relationships decades ago. They were lumped together with rapists and child sex abusers. So I had to deal with these horrified pleas for help from elderly men who perhaps been convicted in the 60s or 50s or 80s who out of the blue had a policeman knock at their door, demanding they give a sample. For many of them, this was a traumatic experience. It was reliving the persecution they'd suffered decades previously. Some ended up very ill, one or two in hospital, at least two that I know of were suicidal. This happened in two 2013. And it was only stopped when I lobbied the Association of Chief Police Officers to demand it to stop, otherwise I go to the press. And in fact, they dragged their feet a bit, so I did go to the press, and within a week or two, they rolled out instructions to end this witch hunt. But why on earth was it pursued? in the first place. Public views about homosexuality, public attitudes, have certainly improved significantly since the 1980s. In that historical homophobic, biophobic, and transphobic period, about 70% or more of the public said that in their view, homosexuality was mostly or always wrong. 70%. In 2012, according to the British Social Attitude Survey, that number had fallen to 28%. 28%. That's still more than a quarter and getting on for one third of the public 
still believe in 2012, which is the latest year for which we have figures, that homosexuality was mostly or always wrong. Now, I take heart from the fact that I suspect that many of these people may believe that, often because of religious reasons, but personally would not discriminate. They may think, like my mother does, who she's an evangelical Christian, she believes the literal Bible that homosexuality is a terrible sin. Well, she believes it's a sin. She doesn't actually believe it's a terrible sin, it's between consenting adults. But she would never, ever, ever disrespect a gay person or support any kind of prejudice or discrimination against gay people. So I expect that some of that 28% probably hold that view. But there certainly is still a hardcore. There's still a hardcore of anti lgbt people out there who do harbour deep-seated prejudice. I deal almost every week with people coming to my foundation, telling stories of harassment by neighbours, people who have been victimised simply because of their sexuality. So last year, when we organised a LGBT Muslim solidarity campaign and leafleted Whitechapel, we were approached by a young Muslim man who told an horrific story how when his neighbours, his Muslim neighbours, discovered that he was gay, they attacked his flat, they threatened him, they attacked him, so much to the point that he was forced to move out of his house. He had to give up his flat because of those threats and violence. Just recently, I heard some tragic news from two gay men down in the southwest of England. Their neighbours had victimised them for two years because they were gay. Smashing their windows, threatening to kill them, trying to kill their pet parrot, abusing them. The police ignored their pleas. The accusers turned around and accused them of harassment. And the police decide, oh, we can't get involved. It's a dispute between two people, two different conflicting stories. The police made no effort to actually get the evidence of the harassment, the real, genuine harassment. Just four weeks ago, one of those men had a heart attack from the stress and died. He's leaving a surviving partner now alone. And it's only since his partner's death that the police have pulled their finger out and started taking action against those homophobic neighbours. So the reality for many LGBTI people in some communities and some areas is that there is still not only a prejudice against LGBTI people, but sometimes active harassment, and even violence. And that is incredibly damaging, the moral sapping, the morale sapping nature of that harassment. The stress, the strain, the anxiety, the fear it provokes is so great, it destroys lives and happiness. It destroys relationships. We know that still today, some parents do kick their kids out of home if they discover they're LGBT or I. In fact, it is one of the biggest causes of youth homelessness today. And it isn't as if it's an equal playing field. The Albert Kennedy Trust, a great charity which supports homeless LGBT youth, reports that most of the young people being referred to them who have been forced out of their homes by homophobic parents come from the African, Afro-Caribbean, and Muslim communities. Now, of course, not all people in those communities are homophobic. 
where there does seem to be definitely a bigger problem there than in some other communities. And that means we have to be extra, extra committed to helping and supporting those vulnerable young people and indeed old people in communities that are particularly uh, affected. You know, anti-LGBT attitudes are not uniform and the consequences are uniform. If you're well educated and got a well paid job, you'll be more likely to know your rights. You'll be better able to approach the authorities and get action. You'll be able to afford, afford a decent solicitor. If you're poor, whatever your race or class or whatever, if you're poor, that's much tougher. There's also you know, differences in geography. So in big cities, there are many more LGBTI support organizations compared to smaller cities and towns and particularly rural areas. So we're not all in this together. You know, we need to recognize that not all <coughs> LGBTI people in this country have the same opportunities, the same protections, the same ability to get redress. Another thing we should remember is that all Britain's equality laws have <coughs> qualified exemptions for religious organizations. Not just churches, mosques, temples, and synagogues, but faith-run schools, hospitals, nursing homes, and shelters for the homeless. They are exempt from the equality laws that now exist to protect LGBTI people. So in the famous Equalities Act of 2010, in the section on harassment, it explicitly says, these protections shall not apply to harassment based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Even worse, in the section on education, it says the same thing. These protections for LGBTI pupils and staff do not apply when it comes to faith-run schools. We know that even today, about one third of all LGBTI people have been victims of hate crimes. Often not just once, but perhaps three, four, or five times during their life. Sometimes it's just abuse and threats, menaces. Other times it's actual physical violence. The kicking to death of a 62-year-old gay man, Ian Bainham, in Trafalgar Square in 2009, is a reminder that even in liberal London, LGBTI people are not always safe. If any of you have been following what's happening in Soho, there's been a spate of anti-LGBT attacks in the heart of the gay village. Our little space in this gigantic city is not a safe place for us. Although homophobic murders are now quite rare, vicious and violent attacks still do happen in London and other big cities on a regular basis. We know that in our schools, over half of all young LGBTI kids have experienced some kind of bullying at school. It might be, at the lower level, teasing or name calling, which can be quite emotionally and psychologically distressing. We can actually include threats and actual violence in the classroom or in the school playground. Yet, despite this, despite this shocking statistic, only half of all schools currently have an anti-bullying program that explicitly addresses biophobic, transphobic, and homophobic bullying. Only half. And we know from some evidence that often this bullying is worse in faith-run schools, and that faith-run schools do the least to tackle. 
So it's no surprise that the levels of self-harm, mental health, anxiety, substance abuse, HIV infections, and even attempted suicide are much higher among young LGBTI kids than their straight counterparts. Much, much higher. Now, perhaps not as high as in decades past, but still higher and still unacceptable. So my remaining few minutes, I'd just like to suggest how we might turn things around to make things better for future generations of LGBTI people. I certainly haven't got a magic bullet or a panacea, but there are a few things or a couple of things that we could fairly easily do. I'd say that schools have a key role to play in challenging attitudes that fuel hate and victimization. After all, no child is born anti-LGBTI. No child comes out of the womb a bigot. That's learned behavior. Some become homophobic because of the bad influence of parents or peers around them. So my theory is that education can help prevent that. Maybe not stop it entirely, but certainly reduce it. I know this from my own successful talks in schools, and from the effective work of education providers like Diversity Role Models and Educate and Celebrate. They go into schools and educate pupils against prejudice. And they get positive results. I've been to schools where the staff have said there's a really big problem here with homophobia, biophobia, and transphobia. We want you to come in to address this issue. So I go into the school to do a talk. But then I said it. Me doing a talk is not enough. There needs to be an ongoing process of challenging these attitudes. So I've asked and urged schools to begin informal equality and diversity lessons. It's not on the official curriculum or anything, but I've got them to agree, or some of them to agree, to do equality and diversity lessons. I've also encouraged them, and sometimes successfully encouraged them, to set up LGBT straight alliances or equality networks where young people themselves in the school take the initiative in challenging prejudice. And it really does work. Certainly, it does not prevent all prejudice. But in the schools that I've been to, where they've begun these initiatives, the levels of prejudice have significantly reduced. And there have been trials in parts of this country, the United States, Australia, and elsewhere, where these lessons have been done on a sustained basis. And all the feedback is that the levels of homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia go way, way, way down. So I would say that we need an initiative from government. I can only reach a small number of schools. And there are a handful of, well, perhaps more than a handful, but there are teachers in some schools who are doing this off their own back but we represent a minority. What we need is a lead from government. The lead from government should be to make education against prejudice a mandatory part of every school curriculum. State schools, voluntary funded schools, independent schools, academies, and free schools. Every school should have a legal requirement to do regular equality and diversity lessons from the very first year of primary school and continuing every year throughout a pupil's school life. I'm not saying once a year. I'm saying a couple of times every month, at least. Because education in citizenship 
in our mutual responsibility and respect towards each other is a fundamental part of a good education and a good society. The question is, will the government do it? There's been lots of lobbying that's gone on, not just from me, but from others as well, over the last few years to try and get these lessons. But so sadly, so far, we have not succeeded in persuading the government. The government won't even agree mandatory sex and relationship education, let alone sex and relationship education that's inclusive of LGBTI issues. So there's a really, really big challenge here. And we need the government, we need the Prime Minister and the Education Secretary to recognise that education in human rights, equality and diversity is a fundamental part of a good education system and a good society. So you can see we have made progress, but there is still much to do. And that's why we must resolve that we won't sit in our laurels. We will recognize there is still unfinished business and we must work together, LGBTI and our straight friends and allies, to make sure it's done. Thank you.